I'm saying that advocate also address the issue of cattle's because not only land was dispossessed, but people were dispossessed of their cattle's and their cattle's were valued and were valuable so much. Thank you. Uh, what a good right. Uh, Sanmonani, my name is Noe Temba I'm Kize. I'm a third year student, economics and finance. Um, to piggyback on what you said, advocate, on um, for us as South Africans to get the land, we must empower the rightful owner. And I think for the government to do that, we need to provide more information. Because when you read section 25 of the constitution, the first paragraph, you're like, okay, we are getting the land. By the time you finish, you're like, are we getting the land? And they amended it now, so we don't know whether we're coming or we're going. On my development economics class, we we're talking about um, what can we do for South Africans and the economy to progress? And someone raised the point of mm. give back the land. And there was so much hysteria because people were like, um, black people don't know anything about farming. And I was like, to be a landowner, you don't need to be a farmer. And there's a lot of um, miseducation and misinformation. And this thing of the people who speak about the land know nothing about the finance and the economics. Mm. And those who know the economics and the finance know nothing about the land. So is it the skill that we do not have or it's just the policies that's not working? Thank that's you. Um, all right. No, Jabulal. Um, yes, I mean, I think most of them were comments, as you correctly point out. The, let me start with cattle. Le uh, <laughs> Angole. <laughs> Um, I mean, you are right about, you know, cattle, and also you're right for another reason, which is that the, you know, native people actually thought that cattle were more valuable than land. And you see this in the Van Riebeek diaries, um, because Van Riebeek comes in and, you see, these guys, they arrived here on a Saturday, on the 6th of April, 1652, in the afternoon, and it was windy. So we know this because it's recorded in a diary by Van Riebeek. They were very hungry. Uh, starved, they wanted to, uh, to eat. And they got three sheep uh, from the Khoi Khoi clans that they met there as gifts, you know, because the Khoi Khoi had seen all of these white people coming in, the Spanish, the English, the Portuguese. So they now see these Dutch, they see them hungry, and they give them food. And that is the first encounter that they had. So their immediate encounter was an encounter of generosity. And the, the, the Khois did not know that these guys wanted to stay. They, they had seen white people come and go. They thought, okay, this group also will come and go. And they didn't know the negotiations that had happened at the uh, Dutch East India Company, where there was a specific decision by the Council of 17 that Van Riebeek will now be a new commander and he will establish a refreshment station in the Cape and that he has no intention of leaving. They finished those uh, three ships, they wanted more. No, then they got cattle, and then, then a trade began where the Dutch would give uh, objects like bracelets, etc., in exchange sometimes for a sheep, etc. And after a while, the, the coins started saying, well, actually, we don't believe that these bracelets you are giving us are worth anything. And they knew actually that these bracelets were worth nothing because uh, uh, Tory one of the coys who had been to England, had told them that actually in England, these bracelets are worth nothing. And so there's no reason why they're giving you this thing in exchange for a cow, so keep your cattle. And as soon as that began happening, the trade relations that were happening on a consensual basis turned into force. So they started literally shooting them. There's one story which actually I write about in, in, in Land Matters that illustrates this imbalance in the sort of so-called cattle trade. At a certain point in time, Van Riebeek sends an expedition crowd. So they send them into the interior, and when they come back in the afternoon, they're expected to bring maybe 10 or 15 sheep, whatever the number is on that particular day. And the way they would do it is that they would go to the head or the chief or the headman of a particular uh, uh, Khoi tribe, and they would say, it's now your responsibility to bring to us 10 sheep for the day. And then if you don't, they had dug uh, next to the station where they were building up this fort, they had dug a hole. And if you don't bring your allocation for the day as a Khoi chief, they would put you in that hole. It was called a dungeon. 
And so there's this letter that's written by this Koi chief who says, Van Ribbig, and they called him the captain. You know, the, the captain says, this is trade. But if I don't give him the allocation for the day, I know that I will be put in a dungeon. So it sort of struck me, this idea of this dungeon, trying to find out what it was. And then I looked at more and more of these uh, uh, primary sources in the archives, and I realized that they had dug a dungeon behind uh, the this construction site. And so they would put you in the dungeon, and then they would bury you up to here. And then they would start kicking you or beating you with a, with a shambo. And then they would take you out, and they would say the following day, when we say 10, we mean 10. We don't mean 5. And so that cattle trade then moved from voluntary and consensual into force. And that was cattle robbery. You know, that's cattle robbery. And so they began robbing those cattle from the Western Cape right into the interior until there was a split in the Dutch East India Company. Some people, uh, some of these Dutch regarding themselves as free men or free beggars, right? And they wanted to go into the interior. But the reason that attracted them into the interior was the possibility of the spoils of cattle. So the encounter began with cattle and not with land. It began with cattle. So that was the central piece. And throughout, actually, I mean, so I looked at the first phase, which is the Dutch encounter with the Khois. They eviscerated them uh, by 1713 when the smallpox epidemic uh, hit the Western Cape. I mean, that community was hardly a community, so to speak of, right? And they were then finished by the smallpox epidemic. And then if you look at the British again, the British arrived there in 1820. Again, they go with a the ship. There are no cattle there. Right? In, uh, when they arrive in, in uh, 1820 in the East End. Even when they come here to KwaZulu, they just have no cattle. Right? And where do they get the cattle? They get them from the indigenous community. It's a fascinating uh, uh, tale, this, because when I finished the, the first book, uh, The Land is Ours, uh, it was still a manuscript. I wasn't sure whether you know, the publishers would publish it. Mm. And I sent it to uh, a professor of history at Stellenbosch. Um, Professor Herman Kilomi, and I asked him to read it and to tell me if it makes sense as a historical text, because it's not a legal text. And so he read it, and then he invited me to go to his house to, to discuss about it. I asked him the, the one question. I said, the one thing I cannot understand is the Boers, or the Dutch, they leave the Cape in 1834, which is when the Great Trek starts. And the reasons they live, and this is what Peter Tiff says, and this is what his daughter says in the correspondence. He says, we're living because the British have taken away our slaves. We cannot survive without slave labor, because the British had ended slavery in 1833. So, well, we're living because we don't have the slaves. We're going into the interior where you can't control us anymore as you as the British. But if you look at the stories of the, the, the trekkers, they are an impoverished community. But by 1934, they are the richest cattle traders. Only 100 years. Mm. Fundamental transformation from an impoverished community to the richest cattle traders in the whole of Africa. So I said, how did this happen? How did you guys just suddenly become so flush with cattle? <laughs> I didn't get an answer. But the story is simple, because if you look at the writings of... Um, um, uh, uh, R.W. Simang, who was asked by the ANC to look at the impact of the Native Land Act in 19, um, he published his paper in 1916, where he said that people are misreading the impact of the Native Land Act because they say that it has dispossessed Africans of land. The Native Land Act has actually dispossessed Africans of cattle. It's easy to understand. If you take the Cecil John Rose formula, one man, one plot, you suddenly, you, if you had five plots, you are now told you had one. You had cattle that could uh, live and eat in five plots. They now have to live and eat in one plot. What do you do with the cattle? So you either have to kill all of the cattle or they get taken over by the new owner. And that is what R.W. Simon was writing about. He says, actually, this buttering arrangement simply doesn't work because the white guy says, and he records this exchange. It's actually quite an evocative one. He records this exchange where the, white, the, white, the new white farmer says to the, the, the native living in the area who now must live, who says to him, I want to buy your cow, 
for two shillings. And, and the native says, no, no, but this cow is worth five shillings. And then he says, I told you I'm going to buy it for two shillings. He says, but I told you it's five shillings. And then, and then the, the native finally says, okay, I'll take two shillings. And then a month later, no money has been paid at all. Even the two shillings that were offered were never paid. And then he says, this story, you can multiply this a thousand times. This was the true relationship between the native people and, uh, and, uh, and the new owners of the farms. I mean, anyway, they, they don't want us to say any of these things because they say, well, you know, why are you bringing the past? You know, we must look at the future. So your point about cattle, I mean, it's like, you know, it's there. I mean, I've you know, got the whole three chapters about it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to speak about cattle in Stellenbosch and uh, the white guys left the room in the middle. So, mm -hmm. so, so, I'm afraid, though, I don't agree with you about the transition. Uh, I agree with you about cattle. I don't agree about the transition. The transition was necessary. And the way in which it worked, black people couldn't postpone their freedom anymore. Uh, the problem is not the transition. I am simply looking at the constraints of the transition. The problem is us. We're not living in the transition. And the political power, uh, uh, balance of power has shifted. We are no longer living in an area where the army is controlled by the whites, where the police are controlled by the whites. All of those are now controlled by us. But despite this, we are still behaving as if we're in the transition. That is my criticism. But the, the, the transition was necessary. It had to happen. We, we couldn't continue you know, being run by white people. We needed a government that looks like us. But that was enough. Mandela has done his job. But thereafter, we should have done real transformation. We just didn't. So that's, that's my critique, is that let's stop constraining ourselves about the settlement of 1994. We must now appreciate that that settlement has served its function. It's time for us to liberate ourselves. And so that's the criticism that I have about the, the, the transition. So, I, I, so I'm afraid your, your point about the, the transition I don't think has, uh, has much purchase. Um, and then, I like your point, uh, where's the lady? Yeah, I, like, I like your point about uh, you know, the, the, the lack of the relationship between ownership of land and knowledge of farming. Although the two, usually, it's a good thing to know about farming if you have land, but it doesn't follow that you can't own land if you don't know how to farm. Many white people actually don't know how to farm. They live in Europe, you know, and the people, and the people that are actually doing the farming are black people. But the one thing I wanted to mention, again, is something I, which was very curious when I researched about this, is that you remember that in 1913, when they were about to pass the act, right, the white people had to decide which land is going to be European. Because they couldn't just say 93% um, is going to be European and 7% is going to be native. They also had to decide which pieces of land. Now, if you look at the records of those decisions, they're most fascinating because they were looking at rain patterns and they didn't know much about rain patterns. They were indigenous rain patterns, looking at where African people were following the flow of the rivers. Because they had realized over years, because black people had been farming for years and years. So over years, they had started looking at rain patterns, looking at the flow of rivers. And those are the areas that had the greatest agricultural potential, such that in 1910, African farmers had the greatest agricultural yield in 100 years, 1910. But that was the last year that they ever had the highest agricultural yield at the Mfengus in the Eastern Cape, right? So 1910 was a pivotal year for native farmers. They had an association, the Queenstown Native Farmers Union, the Transvaal Native Farmers Union, the Natal Native Farmers Union. If you look at their records, 1910 was the year. That had no relationship with whites at all. It was all indigenous knowledge. So the point I was trying to make about that is that the impact of colonialism was also to disrupt native indigenous systems of knowledge. Mm. And they just took away the knowledge system and they put it in the law. So they took them away from the areas that had the greatest potential for agricultural productivity. And that is how they decided which 7% goes to native people. It's not a surprise then that you know, black people are concentrated in Transkei, others are concentrated in Siskei, and you go there, the land can produce nothing. So it's all, you know, scientifically uh, uh, based. 
So I'm, which goes I'm, back? I'm afraid, advocate, I would have to... All right, that's no, fine. No, just wrap up in, in the next five minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, he, he, he says, uh, continue, he says, you must say I must wrap up. So I, I've been overruled, <laughs> and yet I'm the manager. <laughs> All right, so I'll listen to the manager. Then. So I've got five minutes. Five right? minutes, please. All right, thank yeah. you. All right. So just to complete this point about 19, uh, about 19, uh, 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 10. So that's why if you are in class and they are having you know, um, this conversation, what black people need is more land. It's as simple as that. They need more land. You know, they simply cannot sustain themselves with the land allocation that's been made available. They need more and more land. And so when they say black people need title deeds, that's again totally bogus because you can't have a title deed over a shack. What you need, you need a title deed over a decent piece to live. And that's why the debate is always expand the living space, you know, get more people into more land. This country, it's all a joke. This country has enough land to accommodate all of us. I mean, there are only what, 55 million of us. This country is 123 million hectares, 123 million hectares. So there's enough land to accommodate all of us. The only reason it's not doing so is because it's accommodating the, the how many? The 60,000 families, 60,000 families that control 72% of all commercial agricultural land. Now that level of concentration is unsustainable anywhere in the world. So there is a, actually a, an economic efficiency argument that if you have so much levels of concentration, there's simply no way that an economy can sustain itself. There will be an explosion at some point because there's too much concentration. All right, so those are the two questions I thought I should answer. The others, I regarded them as comments. The only point to say is to say to Professor Zulu, I actually agree with him that, that uh, I really do think there's a strong argument to be made about you know, assuming the debate uh, starting from scratch. I was simply pointing the, the factual scenario that in 79, the deal in Lancaster was, if you have land that you acquired under colonialism, you keep it. In 89, the deal in Namibia was, if you le have land you got under apartheid, you keep it. And in 94, in South Africa, if you land you got, that was the deal. You know, you kept the land. That's the deal I'm saying should now be disrupted. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think I did three minutes.